you. There we go. And smaller one will get a good picture for our page. There we go. <laughs> so we can send it out later. Here's a second one. All righty. Go ahead and God. at this point in time, we normally have the president, me, uh, tell you a little bit of things to know. And we started doing that just a few minutes ago. Uh, when I told you that we stand at 27 members with uh, six goals, but opportunities for four more goals, uh, if you need to know as an officer where you can get uh, an opportunity to get uh, Toastmaster leadership training, uh, let me know and we can uh, at least send out uh, information about, uh, I think it's November 12th and 19th in District 47, and I'll send that information along, but there are other districts that are also having their TLIs. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to mention is that the end of October reporting will be reported out on November 11th. And if you have not been aware of it, uh, Toastmasters has been uh, doing in-house a whole bunch of templates on Canva. For those that don't know, Canva is an, a program where you can use it for both creation of slides, you can use it for backgrounds, you can use it for flyers and business cards. And I just ran across this today, is that they've assigned uh, one of their public relations people to create a whole bunch of templates. So you have business cards, you have flyers, you have all sorts of notices, and that's all there on the website. And once I move into uh, a different view, I'm going to drop that name and access to the templates uh, in the chat box. So that's what I want to share with you all today. And does any of the other officers have any information that you'd like to share with the rest of the club? Okay, let's get moving. Uh, can I have, uh, David is the table topics master. And for those that are brand new, Toastmasters are broken down into three segments. The first segment is the prepared speeches. The second segment is the impromptu speeches or table topics. And the last segment is the evaluations. So that's where we're going to go. David, did you want to have a table talk or do you want to go into prepared speeches first? Well, we normally do prepared speeches first, but even before that, we have our tip of the day, which uh, Christine That's Campbell right. has signed up for. And Christine's doing the tip of the day, so let me do that, and I'm going to pull up the agenda in the meantime. Go ahead, Christine, you're on. Okay, great. Uh, Toastmasters, DTM's most welcome guests. We're sure glad that you're here tonight. We're going to have a really good tip tonight. I can't say how great it is. I think it's fabulous. All those phantoms and shadows and everything that may be happening tonight, you just basically need to just get through it and just know there's some sayings that you can learn from Halloween. I'm going to go down some of these and these tips. You just may want to use them on this special night. So eat, drink, and be scary. <laughs> Ghostly greetings. Halloween is a real treat. Have a fantastic night. Happy haunting. Have a beautiful Halloween. Don't be a scaredy cat. And I wish you a happy Halloween. Stop in for a spell. Please park all brooms at the door. These would make great signs at a party, by the way. Caution, witch crossing. Boo to you from our crew. If you want a tasty treat, be sure to holler trick or treat. And moving on, a couple of little jokers here. Knock, knock, who's there? Wanda Witch, Wanda Witch who? Wanda Witch you, a happy Halloween. With that, back to you. Okay, I'm wearing a couple hats today. One of which is 
Toastmaster of the Day. The Toastmaster of the Day is the master of ceremonies. They help support the structure of the meeting where we all can have a whole bunch of fun. But you can't do it alone. There is a village of people helping you out. The first one is the person that takes the role of timer. One of the skills that we develop in Toastmasters is to do things in a time efficient, defined time period. Graham, can you tell us what the role of the timer is today? I could, but somebody else has taken over that role and I believe that was Christine. Christine, can you tell us about the timer? I sure will. Thank you very much. And we're back again with more to your, to your pleasing. We have some wonderful time keepers. And the reason is, is to make sure that we all stay and everybody can do their part within this time frame. And with that, when we have our speakers, our table topics, and our evaluators, their time specifically for that reason. So today, especially for this evening, you're going to see a green pumpkins when it is two minutes before you are ready to end, depending if it's a speech or if it's a table topic that will be different. I will announce the times right before because some speakers may have different times. You'll see this as the yellow. And that is to remind you that green is past and it's soon for the red and we have cat eyes for the red. Back to you. Okay, the next role I wanted to introduce to everybody is the role of the accounter. Go ahead, accounter. Hello, fellow Toastmasters. Yes, I am your accounter and my aim is to eliminate the use of utterances such as ah, uh, um, er, and so, and you know, among others. And these are crutch words and fill words undermine our messages and distract our audiences. I will be listening and at the end of the meeting, I will provide a report. Back to you, Toastmaster of the evening. Thank you very much. Next, we have the role of grammarian. Toro, tell us about that role. Thank you. I will serve as a grammarian in this session uh, who has uh, two roles. One is to pick up a beautiful expression and good usage of words and phrases. And secondly, I will check the grammatical error of everyone's speech, if any. And I will report the result in the evaluation session. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you very much, Turu. Uh, the next is the watcher, is a special role we have in the online clubs. Jim Barber, are you still the watcher? I am indeed, I believe. Hi, everybody. Uh, Toru just described that he is the grammarian this evening. He is the verbal grammarian. I am the watcher, which is a visual grammarian. I'm going to be looking for any fall pause or exceptional uses of the visual frame. I'm going to be looking at backgrounds. I'm going to be looking at how well everyone is centered, how well they make use of the visual part, because of course that is the crucial difference between an online club and an ordinary brick and mortar club meeting. It's that we are dealing with cameras and I'm gonna be watching to see how everybody effectively does that. Back to you, Mr. Toastmaster. Okay, the next role, a very important role, is the chat monitor. And Isabel is doing that role. Isabel, tell us about the chat monitor. As chat monitor, my role is to monitor the comments in the chat by members and guests. When called upon, I will give a report highlighting the most noteworthy comments posted during the meeting. Back to you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much. We also will be having David bringing out and showing us how to do it correctly to do voting for each of our segments. David, you want to comment on that? So, actually, if if you if you want to take a moment, to, well, let's see. 
and I'd be giving some things away if I share my screen right now. So I won't share my screen right now. When, when it comes to the, the point in the meeting where we have something to vote on, I will drop a link in the chat. Click on that link and it will take you to a screen where you can cast your vote. Sure. Guests are welcome to vote. Um, and this just helps tally up the votes a little bit uh, quicker um, and more accurately. So we'll be doing it that way this evening. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll do a tutorial about it some other time. Okay. We now move to our prepared speeches. And we have two. We have Joni doing one. And our second one is by Graham, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Yep. Do you have a title for yours, Graham? Yes, uh, the mystery of Mystery Island. I've sent you the uh, link in the chat. I'll send you the details in the chat. Okay, so Joni, let's start with you. Uh, as a rule, we should have no more than one. Oh, that's not what you want to put. I don't have your prepared remarks for this, but or the title. I just have your name. Why don't you introduce what your title is and, and tell the timer <laughs> when we can start counting. It is on the screen. The title is A New Path. Okay. Excellent. These are five to seven minute speeches. Is that it correct? is a five to seven minute speech, okay. yes. All right, bye-bye. We're going to brainstorm today the benefits of creating a path on logistics and digital management. Now, I know that currently I am speaking to the choir because obviously we decided that we are an online club for a reason. But the thing is, Pathways Toastmasters is an online educational program. Now, I'll give you an example of a current path before I go into the details of why I believe we need to have one on the digital space and logistics. Now, for our current path, for example, team collaboration, you know, there are the five levels. One is mastering fundamentals. Two is learning your leadership style. Three, you, at level three, you increase your knowledge. At level four, you build skills. And then at level five, you demonstrate these skills. This is great and a wonderful opportunity for you to learn. Now, I chose team collaboration. I have my pretty gold pin because it's actually, I do believe it's here, the first path that I completed that the computer chose for me based on a personal deficit. Hard to believe I had interpersonal issues, right? That I wanted to be a hermit. Who could ever believe? So? <laughs> no. But it's true. And in going through the online digital computer chosen path, this is what they said that I could do. And now I'm the go-to person when you need people. Why is it that I think that we need a digital path? Well, I'll explain. Simply put, not everyone is a digital native. I mean, the phantom belief that just because you know how to punch on a keyboard and put information into a computer doesn't necessarily mean that you actually know how to utilize the online space. For example, as vice president membership, and I'm going to ask anybody else here who has the job of doing that, how hard is it to get people to just go on and sign up on Pathways? I found I actually have to hold their hand and walk them through the process. But we all know how to use computers, right? Rob, we all have the basic knowledge of how to get on. We may not be able to maneuver it. And that is a learned skill. So let's go with what exists. What exists right now in Pathways? There are already enough projects already created that this path is nothing to put together. For example, the level one is always going to be the same. For level two, I would suggest the alternate project be manage an online meeting. 
four, level three, you can utilize the project that's already there using presentation software, what I'm doing now. Or for level four, you can use building social media audience as the project that has to be done because there's always one main project, then the elective, and that's across everything. Now, level five, the main project is an HPL or a high performance leadership. A project with a digital space in mind can be created, but here's why I don't agree with that and why I chose HPL. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying, if there is anyone on this planet who despises writing things down, I will say I am that person and I will openly admit it. I hated every second of the HPL project because all I had to do was make notes. I had to put it in order, write it down. But if you're learning a new software or doing something different, case in point, Sonny said today, do you want to know? I can tell you what you're not doing. These are the things that high performance leadership covers. If you decide that, hey, I want to do another software, you get the opportunity to break it down with an already laid out, I get to write it down that you can utilize. Case in point, instead of making it specifically for, let's say we're going to do it and we're only going to do what's known now, HPL offers you the known and the unknown because of the vagueness in the language. Did I mention I don't like it? So if I put it there, you have to know it's important. Now, for my path, I'm going to ask everybody. This is my example. See, I even made a cute little logo. Do you see my logo? It's digital. What would you suggest that I name this? This is why I said at the beginning of the meeting. What would you suggest as a name? I want to go with digital logistics, but dynamic leadership already exists, and I'm not sure that I would want to repeat the DL. But here is. Can anybody unmute? Give me a suggestion. What do you think we could call it? Or what can I refer to it as instead of my path? Nerdy Geek Mastery. No, seriously. Uh <laughs> I like that. Nerdy Geek Mastery. I think that's too many letters and Toastmasters tends to go to just two words as it relates to the name or the naming protocol. But I, don't, I don't think there's an OL, so online logistics would work. Online logistics. That's beautiful. And I never mm -hmm. thought of that. So thank you, David, for that suggestion of online logistics, which I will now refer to this past suggestion as. Now, what you can see is that I made a bit of changes as it relates to the past. Now, on online logistics, you can clearly see that level one is the same. It's mastering fundamentals. But if you notice on level two, what I did was I took out manage online meetings and I put it there. Why? Because technically, the Toastmaster of the day is doing manage online meeting in an online sphere. And it is learning your style. It is something that while it may be a level three project, it's not a focus for us. On the digital sphere, it actually is a part of the learning your leadership style because it is how we get along in this environment. Now, if you notice for level three, I took out. Did I make it too obvious that I was moving it out of the past? I think I did, but I wanted to for a reason. I didn't want it to be a phantom or a mystery as to how everything worked out. Now, if you notice there, the main project, as I stated, using presentation software that could quite easily be placed in level three and the electives remain the same. Now for level four, build social media presence. Any social media presence. You don't only have Facebook and Instagram. There is Discord. There is Clubhouse, which though it may work as a broadcast or a podcast as well, it could actually fall under that project. There is a wide variety, even WhatsApp. 
and the utilization of a WhatsApp audience. Because the point is to create a social media presence. And this is something that requires work and will provide transferable skills towards utilizing the online space. I mean, after all, if you have to learn to share content, create content, etc., it helps you in this space. Now for level five, which is the High Performance Leadership Project. See, I'm here asking for my own torture. It's a good thing I'm presenting on Halloween. I can pretend to be Morticia Adams. And yes, we will do our HPL and everything else remains the same. Now, there are projects, for example, writing a compelling blog or something else that you can utilize. But overall, I believe this would more easily demonstrate the online sphere. Back to you. Today. Thank you very much. Very informative. We all enjoy that. Here's a question that you may have been asked by others. If you go through the 11 paths, some paths have a listing of an HPL or high performance leadership. Others do not. If your path has a high performance leadership, are you doing two of them for that path or not? No, you actually do one high performance leadership. I had a path I, that I already completed and the high performance leadership was mandatory. And then I did another project, which is why it's taken out as an elective option and just placed as the main project. Okay, thank you. Our second speaker tonight is none other than Graham. And he is going to present a wonderful speech. Graham. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, for the purposes of this exercise and before the timer starts, uh, just a bit of background. I'm about to start delivering a series of lectures on board cruise ships. This is a segment of one of those lectures and it is on the mystery of Mystery Island. So for the purposes of the exercise, I want you to imagine that you are on board a cruise ship cruising around the South Pacific, and you've just listened to about 30 minutes of my presentation on the missionaries and mercenaries and whalers and warriors, how Europeans and Melanesians and Micronesians and Polynesians have met and mixed in the South Pacific. So that's the introduction. One of the islands that we're going to visit is Mystery Island. Now, Mystery Island is a really interesting case. Yes, I was swimming in this water, but you can't see me because I was taking the photo. The reason that I mention it is that its actual name is Inyog Island. It's an inhabited island about a kilometre off the larger Anatium. But why is it called Mystery Island? Ah, well, there's the mystery. There are, in fact, two theories, and both of them relate to European colonization of the South Pacific. One is related to the fact that there is, on Mystery Island, a grass airstrip, supposedly built by the Americans in World War II. Now, some locals will tell you that the name Mystery Island comes from the fact that the Japanese soldiers in the area had no idea where the US planes were coming from, and so it became a mystery. Of course, if you think about that for a moment, it makes absolutely no sense, because Japanese planes would have spotted this airstrip in a moment. There's another reason why it doesn't fit the theory, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. But there is another theory that you'll be told, and that's because of the strategy adopted by the blackbirders. Now, blackbirders were Europeans who effectively kidnapped Solomon Islanders and those from Vanuatu and took them to become indentured servants, essentially slaves, in the sugarcane fields of Australia, for example. Well, the theory is that Mystery Island was chosen in the 1850s by Australian blackbirders who were kidnapping the island's men to work on Queensland's new and burgeoning sugarcane farms as a safe haven from which they could work their trade. Why? Because the superstitious and cannibalistic Anatium Islanders, those from the big island next door, feared that Inyug was inhabited after dark by ghosts. 
and there was no way they were going to stay there once the sun went down. So it meant that those blackbirders were able to live there free of any fear of under darkness attack. Well, I have to tell you, unfortunately, the real reason for the name Mystery Island is much more prosaic. It's a public relations name decided on by the old Sitmar cruise line. It seems that the Fair Star, and some of you may have even sailed on the Fair Star many years ago, would regularly sail by and occasionally would try to put passengers ashore by tender, something which we will do much more successfully, I might tell you, since they've built a dock. The company wanted a more romantic name for Ineal, so PR manager Ron Connolly came up with the name Mystery. <sighs> and another legend dies. In any case, the island does have a landing strip, but it was not built in the 1940s by the Americans and become a mystery. No, in fact, it was built by the British in 1961. <sighs> it's still used today for twice weekly flights, which brings supplies to nearby Anatium. But nobody lives on this island itself. Every year, about 65,000 guests go ashore by ships' boats for days of swimming and beachcombing and snorkeling and buying shells and fresh fruit and carvings and necklaces at a market set up by the Anatian people who come across on ship days. Now, this is, I have to tell you, a major earner for these people. And that brings us to another wave of colonisation, economic colonisation. We've spoken about the colonization of the Polynesians and the Micronesians and the Melanesians and more particularly the Europeans, particularly the influence of European colonization during and after World War II. But imagine the impact that mass tourism, especially in the cruise industry, is having on these islands and this island in particular. Now, I am on this cruise, like you, because I love cruising. This is about cruise number 12 for my wife and I, and I'm hoping that there are going to be a lot more. It's our sixth time to the Pacific Islands, and each time we've come here, we have loved it. But we also recognise that there is an impact on the local population. Imagine, if you can, all the passengers on this ship and there are 4,000 passengers on the ship that we're on today. Imagine if we were all to get off on an island like Mystery or Lefou or Mare or the other islands that we will visit in our trip. That would be like, well, six jumbo jets all landing all at once. You can imagine what that does, not only to the ecology of the islands, but also to the local economy. Tourism has become the biggest single factor in the Vanuatu economy. While our visit to Mystery Island and to Port Vila, the other point in Vanuatu that we are going to visit, may just be a drop in the bucket by comparison. Add enough drops and the underlying culture could well be washed away. For New Caledonia, Mare, Lefou, Numia, tourism is, well, not quite as important. Mining, as we mentioned earlier, is still a very, very big industry. But again, the impact cannot be ignored. So the question is, is such economic colonization a bad thing? Even if it is, what can we done? Should we as visitors perhaps not be coming here? Well, I don't know about that. And I don't know about such things because they're above my pay scale anyway. But I mention it just to show you that the ongoing colonization of the South Pacific continues as it has for millennia. Now, as I mentioned, when I began this lecture 45 minutes ago, I am not an expert. I'm just a journalist, a dilettante, somebody who researches and finds out information and hopefully presents it in an informative and entertaining way. But as you can see, I'm not an expert. I was telling you the truth. But I'll also tell you this. This is a truly fascinating region, and I hope I've been able to give you at least some idea of its history today, and I hope you'll join me as we visit these islands and learn about their culture, their experience, and more. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Graham. I'm sure everybody enjoyed that as much as I did. 
At this point, we're going to go to the segment known as impromptu speeches or table topics. Well, let's and get a timer's report first. That's true. Timer. Yes, we have Joni was eight minutes and 42 seconds and Graham was six minutes and 56 seconds. Back to you. Okay. Was Joni supposed to be five to seven? That's what I was told. Yeah. Okay. So All right. It's Graham so, by a landslide. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Time has uh, made Graham the uh, winner for this competition. Uh, at this point, can we also, Timer, tell us the time frames for the table topics? Yes, I sure will. Now, I have different clubs, and some use one minute, some use two minute table topics. What is this club? Uh, two minutes. Okay. So on the table topics, we want you to use as much time as you can for your expertise and practicing. So one minute, it's ongoing, you want to at least make a minute, is the green pumpkins. A minute and a half is the halfway mark. And then at two minutes, it is red eyes, and you need to close it up pretty quick. So back to you. Thank you. Okay. David, you're up. All right. I am your Phantom Table Topics Master for the evening. And our guests are both experienced Toastmasters, so don't think you're immune. Be on your toes. So I'd like to hear from one of our folks about a favorite ghost story or a favorite horror story and why you find it so engaging. Isabel. Thanks. Isabel, tell Thanks us about your favorite ghost story or horror story. Can you repeat that question, Mr. Toast, Mr. Tabletop Master? Sure. Uh, I'm asking you about your favorite ghost story or horror story. A scary, okay. scary story that you find engaging and why. Okay, thank you. Um, can I think of uh, what um, as a well-known story that's uh, uh, my favorite, but I just experienced a scary dream last night. It's perfectly prepared for the Halloween last night. I, I guess it's already this morning, early in the morning. I was uh, in uh, by a lake and I started playing the water, standing on the shore. Then suddenly many, many figures showed up. Uh, a lot of people, they were like uh, dancing on the, on the lake and some uh, skiing and all kinds of things that now I think back, people cannot do that. But in the dream, it feels like everybody is doing that. And so I joined them and I jump into the water. I start swimming. And I was, uh, I was just, uh, you know, almost like I'm, I was flying in the water. Then suddenly something went wrong. I felt, I bumped into something. Then I looked down, an arm grabbed me. And it was, I, I don't know how to call it, a ghost under the water. Then my analytical mind immediately started working. I even didn't have time to get scared. I was thinking, how am I, how am I gonna get out of this situation? I'm gonna punch him or I'm gonna scratch him. Do I have any weapons? Mm -hmm. And I look around, I find all the people that was playing in the water, they all disappeared. And suddenly like a chill went through me. I feel like, oh my God, these are nymphs. They tricked me into the water. Now they're gonna kill me. Then I woke up in my dream. Back to you, all right. Mr. Table Master. Wow. That that was that was fairly elaborate. One of the things I liked about that word "phantom" as our word of the day today is that "phantom" can mean a lot of things. It can it can mean something that is ghostly, it just means something that's that's unreal, that's illusory, that that slips away from you. And I was thinking about that in terms of a phantom job prospect, a job that you thought was just over the horizon, looked like a good good opportunity, and it slips away, it evaporates. Deborah Carr, have you ever had that experience or have you ever given advice to somebody who is in that situation of the, the phantom job prospect? 
Thank you for such a great question, Mr. Table Topics Master. It's always interesting when I get asked questions about career or things that are phantom that I thought would be as, well, you think they're going to be a certain way, but yet they're not. Other than certain relationships, I've had the best careers in my life. It probably could be because I was always self-employed and I had the best barber salon and the best team and it just always worked out that way. However, you can get those phantom relationships and they're all together different. And I think everybody, well, probably most people can relate to that too, if you're single at any point in time in your more adult life. But I've just been very, very lucky and very fortunate is all I can say about Phantom. One thing I would like to say is I have not seen Phantom of the Opera. I'm probably the only person in my friends, in my, in my list of friends that hasn't seen it and they're all bugging me. So it's one thing I'm gonna be doing this next year for sure. So back to you and thank you for the great, the great one, but it's, it's really relationships for me, not the jobs. Okay. You've been ghosted. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's not fun. Or I ghosted. <laughs> There's also the story that ends and it was all a dream. Wizard of Oz being one of the, the notable examples, but there, there are others. Uh, actually, the Bob Newhart show, I understand, ended that way. I don't think I ever saw that episode, but... Are you disappointed when it turns out the story was all a dream? John Drinkwater. Thank you, Mr. Topics Master. That reminds me, Mrs. Webb, you're going too fast. It's a bit close. It's all right, I'll get out your side. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think my whole life is a dream. When I was a little boy, which is uh, a couple of years ago, I got some extra tuition to make sure that I started my education in a positive way. And I was encouraged to write a story. And what I did was I wrote a story about all the things I would like as a child. I'd like a remote control plane. I'd like a bigger piano, please, Dad. But it must have been considered a phantom story by my parents because I didn't get any of the things that I asked for. Not one, not a single one was delivered to me on Christmas morning. And therefore, frustrated by all of this, I did decide to turn each episode into a dream because it was the only way I could think of in my little head to forgive my parents for ignoring my wishes and wants. Of course, if I thought about the dream now, the only phantom that I would want would be a Rolls Royce phantom, would it not? And I may be a dream as well. If you want to annoy anybody on a Zoom meeting, all you need to... <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster. All right. Very well. All right. One of the phantoms that comes to, to my mind right away is the special effect that you encounter in the Disney haunted house. I know that they certainly have it at Disney World. I think it's also at Disneyland out in California. And it's it, there there are some some very elaborate 3D effects that you encounter as you go through this haunted house 
roller coaster ride. I don't know if it's quite a roller coaster. It's a slow coaster. It's a dark coaster, I think, is, is actually the, uh, the industry term for it. Susan, can you tell us about, have you ever been scared in a, a carnival or a theme park haunted house? Is there anything scary or delightful that you've encountered in one of those settings? You're still muted. And thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. That's a very good question. And I have been through the haunted house ride or walkthrough, I can't remember which, in um, Disney World in Florida. And that was when my son was only three, but he was like three to four. And at that time, it seemed perfect because it wasn't too scary for him, but it still has some special effects that were interesting. And he did just fine with that. And it was fun to notice the different things that they had shown in there. Shown in there. Um, when I was younger, as in high school, I liked going to the scary movies. I don't know what it is about being young, especially teenagers. Maybe you want to grab your boyfriend and pretend like you're scared. I don't know. <laughs> but I really enjoyed every kind of um, scary movie back then, you know, the horror movies, um, except for The Exorcist. That was a little bit after, before my time, but that maybe truly gives me the creeps. And if anybody even talks like that person sounds when they're sounding like that horrible spirit, it just totally um, gets under my skin. <laughs> but as I've gotten older, um, I don't enjoy those at all. I don't know why I ever like them. I certainly don't like the slasher movies, um, but I do like the the movies that have the um, supernatural kind of effects to them. That I still I feel that there are some supernatural things like ghosts and spirits and that type of thing. Um, but yeah, sometimes the scariest thing of all is life. <laughs> <laughs> and the scariest thing to me in the past three years was I accepted a job as a consultant. I'd always been in the hospital as a nurse. I accepted this job as a consultant, which had always wanted to be a consultant. And I have to give these two hour presentations based on my clinical background. But I started my job in November, and then COVID happened right when it was time to start doing these presentations. And I had no clue whatsoever how to use them. <laughs> and no matter how hard I tried to be prepared, as soon as that meeting started, there was some new flub, some new something that could happen with Zoom that was, it was the most miserable year and the scariest year of my life. <laughs> Thank you, that's all. All right. Another great trio actually of phantoms from fiction the fictional world would be the ghosts in a christmas carol totally different holiday but we have three different phantoms who's your favorite ghost in a christmas carol andre smolenko Thank you very much, Mr. Table Topics Master. What's a wonderful question about a favorite ghost in Christmas Carol? The ghost of the past. That's something that really came into my mind straight away. Something that already happened in the past. And those ghosts probably would, would be tormenting me for something I've done wrong. And then I'm thinking, perhaps no, maybe the ghosts of the future something unknown, something that I never experienced, perhaps they could be tormenting me. And then again, I'm thinking probably the ghosts of the present, those little creatures that within inside of me, always doubting what's gonna happen next or how you're going to react, what happened in the past. So all those three ghosts are quite important to me and I have a feeling they probably tormenting some of us right now, especially that ghost in the right hand, top right hand corner, all in white, you know, with beautiful eyes, 
who is quite happy that I mentioned that ghost. If you can just switch it uh, into not the speaker view, but everybody view, you will get an idea what I'm talking about. Overall, going through the ghost from the Christmas Carol and watching it over and over again with my children or with my family for Christmas, every time I find something new and fascinating and relating to the feelings the main character is going through when he is a miser, then taken away into the past, and then he is given a chance, a chance in life through remembering what he has done before and choosing to live his future in a better way. Every time it really works for me and it helps me and my children to reevaluate a few things that we've done in the past and they always ask for forgiveness for whatever they did wrong. The baby, please forgive us. And I'm like, hey, and you forgive me too. So we can move on together into and in hopefully less mischievous life. But those three ghosts, I would say equally important to me. Back to you, Mr. Table Topics Master. All right, thank you, Andre. One, one other ghost that wandered along, or one other phantom that cropped up in our fictional world in just the last couple of decades that occurs to me is the phantom menace. Some of you remember, remember we, we had three Star Wars movies and then we had a flashback to the phantom menace, which was supposed to be episode one. Did you? stick with Star Wars past that point? Or were you ever engaged in Star Wars as a cultural phenomenon or as something that you cared about? Natasha. <laughs> I had a feeling he was going to call on me. Uh, Star Wars. I was not into The Menace or Star Wars. Just recently, I really began to not celebrate, but to embrace Halloween. I am a, an educator. I am a high school teacher, and we really don't get into the fancy into all of that. Now, how, if you had asked me about Cinderella, <laughs> perhaps I can tell you something about Cinderella, who ended up being invited to the ball. And perhaps the ball was a Halloween ball. I do not know. I do know that she had some very mean sisters who I wished the phantom would have taken them away because they were so mean to her. However, Cinderella, I can see that she enjoyed the ball that was Halloween. No, I am not a menace. Fan, nor was I a Star Wars fan. Back to you, Mr. Phantom Table <laughs> Topics Master. Ooh, ooh. Aja, Aja. <laughs> Let's see. Look at Sonny. <laughs> Well, I, I guess the cruelest phantom you could have was phantom candy, where, where you thought you were going to get some candy and the candy was not there, did not come through. Antoinette, what is your regret about phantom candy or what, what is your favorite candy? Thank you to Uswas, uh, David, for such an interesting question. At a glance, chocolate. 
I love chocolate bars. Cadbury, M&M's, those are my favorite chocolates. As a matter of fact, there was a particular time where at work, someone came and was, should I say someone came to fix the scanner. And, when, and the, for, for that reason, the scanner was not working. And when they opened up the scanner, guess what they found in the scanner? M&Ms, <laughs> that's why it was not working. And I have to confess, it was me. Actually, at work, they would call me M&Ms. Almost every day, I eat a pack of M&Ms, the yellow pack, not even the brown pack or the blue pack, the yellow pack. As well as almost every day, I love to eat Cadbury chocolate, hazelnut. When I'm traveling, going to Grenada or wherever, and in the airport, I would buy a big, large, the largest size of Cadbury. And I would just eat them that over and over again. Basically, I grew up with chocolates. Let's just say that. In a family who loved to eat chocolates. When I was a little girl, my cousins would say, go on the bike, go down the road, go to the shop and buy me Cadbury chocolates. And I used to do that religiously. Now that my cousins are in their 60s, of course, they no longer live with me or I don't no longer live with them. I still have that habit. And no matter what, I say, oh gosh, I must really try not to eat any more chocolates, but I can't. I don't know what reason. Can anybody suggest any reason? Can you give me a suggestion what, how to not eat any more chocolates? Please <laughs> let me know. <laughs> Back to you. All right, <clears throat> wonderful. Madam Timer, can we get a timer's report, please? I don't know. When she started talking about chocolates, my mind went. I can't, <laughs> I can't handle all this. All right. Yummy. Okay. Isabel, one minute and 41 seconds. Deborah Carr, one minute and 18 seconds. John was two minutes and 17 seconds. Susan was two minutes and 37 seconds. Andrix was two minutes and 20 seconds. And Natasha was one minute, 44 seconds. And Antoinette, two minutes and 28 seconds right before the cutoff. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to disqualify you, Susan. I'm so sorry, but uh, uh, another time uh, you'll have to come back uh, after you join the club. You know, you'll be able to win the prize. But uh, um, but I will be posting the voting link in the chat in just a moment. And meanwhile, back to you, Toastmaster of the Day, Dr. Byrne. OK, well, I give a hand to everybody in a club that participated, listened carefully, commented in the chat. All these things are good things. But one thing everyone agrees on is that the evaluation section is the time where someone in the club has listened carefully to your speech. They've paid attention to what they saw, what they heard, and how did it make them feel. And they're going to give a report back to you so that you can grow. And that's what evaluations are all about. We had two speakers, Joni and Graham. And can I have the evaluator for after the timer tells us how long the evaluator has to do their evaluation? Christine. Thank you. Again, different groups have different times. I have it at three minutes. So it would be two minutes, the green pumpkins. Then the Fire will be at two and a half and three minutes will be the cat eyes. Back to you. Wonderful. So our first speaker was Joni and her evaluator was like two pages ago. Who's Joni's evaluator? I am. 
But Blue. Shouldn't, shouldn't the general evaluator uh, be running yeah. that? Let me do that. Let me give you David Carr to run the general evaluator section of the meeting. Uh, Sonny is the general evaluator. All so, right, then. <laughs> Think that there exactly. is a phantom with Andrew Byrne. <laughs> However, let's proceed. Greetings, fellow Ghostmasters, and a warm welcome to our guests. For the benefit of our guests, I am the general evaluator today, and I conduct the evaluation portion of our meeting. Before I start, quick question. What word has the first six letters of the alphabet? A, B, C, D, E, F, anybody? Okay, I'll tell you, feedback. And that's what we're about to do. I will be calling on an all-star, not a phantom team, but an all-star team that assists me with giving feedback to our speakers. And then I'll evaluate the meeting as well. So first, help me welcome evaluator number one, Lewis Brown. He will evaluate the speech given by Joni Laidlaw. Thank you, Madam GE, fellow Toastmasters, and especially Toastmaster Joni. For those of you who may not know, the objective of Joni's speech, the main objective was to persuade us to buy into her idea. And Joni, your idea of choice about developing digital skills is on point. That's something that is a great idea for trying to get us to buy into what you are about to sell. Your delivery, Joni, I always enjoy when you deliver your content. It's very, very good. You have great pace, great vocal inflection. I saw there was a couple of times when your voice was up and down and some good vocal clarity. But I will say, I don't know if it's my speaker or what, but it's almost like the frequency of your microphone perhaps was kind of low. And I think as I'm getting older, it's getting tougher for me to hear very clearly. So I think there may be some fine tuning that may be called for with your microphone. I really liked how you had a little bit of audience interaction there. That was a great break in the flow of your speech. One of the sub objectives was for you to have for this to be well organized. I personally needed a little bit more structure and organization, to be honest. You had a lot of great information to share. Now, while it's not necessary to say, I will share with you the following three things, one, two, three, we know that's kind of like the principles of Toastmaster speech making. In this case, I would have found a little bit, a little helpful in terms of the entire digital path. What three things are, did you want to share that you feel are very important to us? And you could have even used like a selling model. What is the pain? What is the, or the problem? What is the solution and why your solution is the best? In other words, why is this so important to you in order to persuade us why it should be important to us? Let me also comment on your opening. I believe you said something like we're going to brainstorm and then some additional wording. That seemed a little incongruent with the rest of your speech because I didn't notice any, any brainstorming aside from say the piece of audience interaction. It was really an informational delivery. I also would have liked to have heard a stronger hook, like a question or a stat or a quote, something to get us in right from the beginning as far as why this idea is so important to us and to the public in general. Joni, one thing with your slides I noticed is you had screen share on. At the same time, I noticed some background slides or content in your video thumbnail, I found that to be just slightly distracting. Well, not so uh, important. I did find it to be a little interesting to know, which in line with the digital skills development, I would have thought, wow, you know, <laughs> maybe not do that as far as a, a showing us the importance of, say, learning presentation skills. I had a lot of notes, Joan. I'm going to share more with you in terms of when I send you the written evaluation, because one other thing I just want to add real quickly is in terms of that last slide that you showed, there was a lot of content on that. Maybe breaking that apart over several slides would have been more effective. Otherwise, I it definitely had an impact on us because I saw a little bit of interaction between you and Graham in the chat box. So end of the day, you achieved your objective of persuading one of our very finicky Toastmasters in this group. Anyway, back to you, Madam G. 
Thank you very much, Lewis Brown. You are amazing as an evaluator. Now, help me welcome evaluator number two, Jim Jamie Barber. He will evaluate the speech given by speaker two, the cruise man, <laughs> Graham Cairns. Thank you, Madam General Evaluator, my fellow Toastmasters, and our most welcome guest this evening, but especially, of course, Toastmaster Graham Cairns. Graham, you indicated in your preliminary remarks that this was a segment of a complete presentation that you were going to be giving on a cruise ship. And so I decided that I would evaluate it in that from that perspective, not as an online presentation, not even as a Toastmasters presentation, but rather as if I were on a cruise ship, what would I think, what would I be involved in, that sort of thing. Before I get into that, though, let me comment for a moment on your title. I love your title, and this is something that applies kind of to everybody, and that's why I want to take a moment to mention it. The Mystery of Mystery Island. A good title is intriguing. It, When people hear it, they want to hear at least the first sentence or so of what you're going to be saying. And that's the purpose of the title, is to get people interested so that you can then move from that and, and start to maintain that interest. And the mystery of anything is going to accomplish that because people are people love mysteries, and so they're going to do that. And then, of course, saying the mystery of Mystery Island is just a wonderful way of using repetition to do that. So this was a great. I don't know that you would use that title in your in your cruise. It probably wouldn't be appropriate, but it was worthwhile mentioning just in terms of Toastmasters. Great title. Now let's get to your presentation itself. You are a master, Graham, of the conversational presentation. You don't speak to us. You certainly don't preach to us. You talk with us. You simply lead a one-sided conversation, but we are it's not like you're hogging the conversation. We are delighted to listen to you talk. You were informative. You were entertaining. And that's a difficult balance to maintain, because on, especially on a cruise ship, you, you want to inform people. That's, that's kind of part of your job. But if you inform them too much, they're going to lose interest. They're, they've got other things that are going to attract them. So you've got to be entertaining at the same time that you were informative. This was a thought-provoking presentation. You, you brought into that, are we really doing a good thing? But you didn't, it wasn't necessary. Uh, you weren't preachy. You didn't really come down. It wasn't heavy in any sense. So am I out of time, really? Oh, that, that was yellow. I'm sorry. Okay, never mind. The wig is a little tight. Let's see. Oh, I loved one phrase that you had in this. This is an illustration of the way that you brought everything together. It, halfway through your presentation, you paused and you said, and another legend dies. That was so well done. I love that. That was an example of putting entertaining, putting informative. It just worked across. You said you weren't an expert. You were an enthusiastic storyteller. Frankly, I have no suggestions. I do have a regret. I have a regret that I'm not going to be on the cruise with you. And I definitely have a regret that I'm not going to hear the rest of the presentation because this was terrific. Madam General Evaluator. Thank you very much, Jamie Jim Barber. Now, Mr. Timer, can you give us the times while I drink some blood? <laughs> of both evaluators, did they make their time? I'm sorry, I'm just obsessed with what you're doing. So. <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh, really? I didn't even hear a timer. Yes, we have. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Lewis was three minutes and 20 seconds. Excellent. Jamie, a little bit over at three minutes and 48 seconds. 
Miss Madam Timer, does that mean someone is disqualified? I don't want to say it. I'm going to let someone else say it. <laughs> I just can't. So <laughs> it was excellent. I, I, I'll, I'll be, say I'll it be then. mean. We'll, yeah. we'll, we, we can disqualify Jim. Yep. I'm out. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe my cat eyes weren't red enough. I, I shouldn't do things like that. Maybe it's confusing. So I'll take the blame. Thank you so uh -huh. much. Can, well, can we still get uh, some vote? Anybody more want to vote for uh, table topics? Uh, I'll post that link in the, the chat again. I'd like to get a couple more votes if possible. Thank you, please. I'll be coming to your house if you don't vote right now. Okay, moving on. Now it's time to hear from some of my helpers tonight. First, let's hear from our grammarian, Toru Marioma. Please take the virtual stage. He's been listening for good and bad uses of the language, as well as points for improvement. Thank you very much, General Lavariet. As far as I uh, watch and listen, I didn't have any, find any grammatical error. So let me move on to the beautiful expressions and good expression. Mm -hmm. Andrew Byrne said, village of people, referring to mm -hmm. a lot of people. And there is a good way uh, to do, to express it. Graham Kent said, public relation name, that is, not real name, specially selected name for promotion. And that is good way to express. And Jim Barber said, when he explained the role of a watcher in contrast with a grammarian for language, that watcher is a grammarian for graphics, images background and that is uh, very precise and getting to the point definition i think kadri uh, said analytical mind is walking suddenly that's good think hard and one of the guests john drink water said my whole dream, my whole life is a dream. Good. And Andres Melenko also said about his life, who oh knows, someone else's life, maybe less mischievous life, an excellent way to describe one's life. And uh, our first evaluator said, uh, buy into one's idea. That's good. Sell, promote one's idea and persuade to accept it. And this is good. And that's all. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Please help me out, fellow Ghostmasters. Who is the word of the day person? Who keeps count of the word of the day factum? Grammarian. Mr. Toriyama, do you have that information? Hmm? <laughs> we'll just move on right now. If anyone has said the word of the day, raise your hand right now. Raise your hand if you said the word of the day phantom. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> that is so out of this world. So now uh, I will sorry. go ahead, Mr. Toriyama. Did you have something? Sorry. To I didn't count the number of uh, what of the day. No worries. No worries. Uh, I don't really know how an alien sounds. However, what I do know sounds the ah counter, the person who is taking note of our uhs, ums, ahs, and the like. Please help me welcome our ah counter, Natalia. Natalia Van Allison. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam General Evaluator, green person. <laughs> I want to say that you all did an excellent job as far as the filler words are concerned. I did not, except for my filler words, I heard a few ums and ahs from me. I heard a lot of storytelling and with the storytelling, of course, everything was very well spoken. No one used any filler words. Double clutches, I, I, uh, uh. Hmm nothing the phantom evidently removed all of the filler words <laughs> this evening <laughs> great job everyone back to you madam green i'm sorry madam general evaluator thank you so much <laughs> wizard of oz natalia <laughs> Thank if I'm you. going out of place please forgive me but next we will have our chat monitor New member, Isabel Kadori. Isabel, what you've been seeing? Thank you, Madam General Evaluator. I saw members have been active on the chat, but no excessive lengthy conversation. Our Fenton Toastmaster, Table Topic Master used the chat to call for votes, and I saw some constructive interactions on the chat, notably our, after our speaker number one educated us about pathways, her speech intrigued active conversation about certain features on um, pathway paths and the levels. I thought that was uh, um, something worthwhile to be highlighted. And also I saw some humors and the use of word they in the chat from Dr. Uh, 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 General Evaluator Sunny Fridge. She said that there is a phantom putting extra time on Junie's speech. <laughs> That's all, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, chat monitor. Another person, I don't want to throw shade on him. Our watcher, Jim Jamie Barber, has had his eyes on all of us. Please, Jim Jamie, give us your report. With pleasure, Madam General Evaluator. The watching everybody at online presenters, frankly, is easy. This is a professional club composed of professional presenters. Everybody made great use of their visual frame. Everybody was reasonably well lit. I say reasonably because actually I wasn't. But as I said, I'm, I'm breaking in a new setup here. And so I'll, I will get my lighting straightened out by the next by the next meeting. But everybody was doing great. I loved the backgrounds. I loved the use of special effects. And uh, special, of course, uh, the, the most creative was without a doubt, Sunny Fridge, who throughout the meeting, yeah, absolutely, throughout the meeting, yes, just did wonderfully, wonderfully, wonderfully well. And that was basically it. We'd done good. Back to you, Madam GE. <laughs> Thank you so much. We've done good, but we are running out of time. Thank you for all of the Toastmasters who stepped up and took one, two, and three roles. Now, let's find out our final votes. Mr. David, vote counter, what information do you need to give us right now to get these votes done? Any information? Uh, oh, he has winners. Oh, one thing I don't have is a drum roll. Oh, David speaking because he's still muted. <laughs> yeah, drum roll. Best you can do. Uh, best fix simile you can do. Best speaker, Graham Karen. Yeah. What a oh, surprise! A what a shock! Uh, and he gets we, a cruise as a prize. Yeah, that's Yay. right. Exactly. <laughs> Best table topics, John Drinkwater. Woohoo! Okay. Well, you have to join now, John. Oh, okay. And Best Evaluator, Lou Brown, uh, again by default. And that is all I got. 
Thank you very much, everyone, for participating in our Halloween theme. There weren't too many phantoms, and so that made it such a great meeting. That concludes the general evaluation segment in the interest of time. So let's welcome back our Toastmaster master of the day, Ghostmaster, Andrew Byrne. Oh, thank you very much. Everybody did such a fantastic job. Everybody, amazing, amazing. So it's now 9.01. We have two choices. We can each honor Isabel Cadoria on becoming a new member to the club, or we can go through our formal ceremony, which is about four or five minutes. What is your choice? I say, we know that we voted her into the club. There is nothing to say other than, do you want to be a member of this club, Isabel? If so, say yes. Yes. And she will <laughs> honor all the Toastmaster requirements. There are 10 of them, which include things like when you prepare for a role, you'll be prepared and you'll show up when you say you will. Things of that nature. Basically, following the core principles. So at this point in time, do you have any questions before you cross that threshold and become a Toastmaster in the elite online presenters club? No questions. I'm very pleased. All right. <laughs> and we are. We're all pleased. At this point in time, I pronounce you with the power invested in me as a member of our club because we have already voted you in and you've reached this, the appropriate number of votes. Yay, you are a member of our club.